Support for Carolina Business Review provided by Grant Thornton, an international accounting, tax, and business advisory organization dedicated to serving middle market companies. Grant Thornton, a passion for the business of accounting. Novant Health is a not-for-profit group of hospitals and medical clinics caring for surrounding communities. Their nurses, physicians, and staff are nationally recognized for their remarkable devotion to patient care. And by Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. In business, if the energy sector were a clothing fashion, it would be the hottest trend on the fashion show runways. The question is, would it be a members-only jacket, spandex, leg warmer kind of fad, or is it more of a Ralph Lauren-style staying power? Welcome again to the most widely watched source for Carolina business and public policy. I'm Chris William, and this time on this edition of CBR, energy from renewable to fossil fuel, from public policy, to the cutting edge technology, how is it a driver of our region's development and what near term challenges could seriously derail the industrial sector's momentum? We will start in just a moment. Major funding also by the Duke Endowment, a private foundation in Charlotte, enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches and children's services. And by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina, who's responsible for rising health care costs. Join Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. This edition of Carolina Business Review was recorded October 7, 2011. On this week's program, Johan Enslin of the Energy Production and Infrastructure Center at UNC Charlotte, Bill Mahoney of the South Carolina Research Authority, Jeffrey Merrifield of the Shaw Group and Wayne Wilkins of Energy United. Now, Chris William. Hello, welcome to our program. Sorry, uh, as always, we have all these <laughs> offline chats, and that's when the that's when the great stuff is really talked about. Uh, gentlemen, welcome to the program. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Chris. Uh, Jeffrey, I'm going to ask you because you're closest <laughs> to me, but. You know, Jeffrey, we all talk about energy and, you know, we've talked about energy clusters before the program. When we talk about energy now, it, what are we talking about? Is it the utility business? Is it the coal fire plants? Is it the natural gas guys? Is it the, the solar farms? When we talk about energy, really, what are the inside baseball guys? Well, it's, it's all of the above. Um, I mean, it, it's funny. On the, on the entry, we talked about is it new? Is it lasting? I mean, the company I work for, the, for the Shaw Group, you know, our predecessor company has been building power plants since the late 1800s. So for us, we do think we're more of, of a Ralph Lauren, uh, perhaps a Levi's kind of yeah. product. But it, it comprises a variety of different elements. First, you have uh, the companies that are the utilities, the people who provide the power to the consumer, like, like uh, um, um, Energy United, Duke, Progress. You have companies that supply p large power plants, whether it's the technology itself, like a Siemens, a GE, a Westinghouse, and a Riva, mm -hmm. or the companies that put the parts and pieces together, like Shaw and some of our competitors. Um, increasingly, it's smaller providers, people who can put in solar, who can put in wind units, biomass, geothermal. And, and also today, even here in Charlotte, we see people who are involved in, in some of the smart grid activities, trying to be more s smart, for lack of a better word, yeah. about our use of power and be more efficient in that regard. So it's all of the above. And, and Johan, as, as you sit over here, and you're, you're the CFO of a solar company, but you're also uh, head of a, of a, let's call it a think tank, and really an initiative at one of the University of North Carolina systems, the UNC Charlotte system, called EPIC. You know, you kind of have a foot in both areas. When you talk about energy, is it, this not, might not be a fair question, but I think you're going to get the, the, the inference. Is it is it kind of a wild west time in the energy, like, Wow, everything. We've got all this new technology. Public policy is up for grabs. Is it, is it, is it that kind of excitement almost going on? Well, I think the, uh, the excitement is definitely there. Uh, we see currently a major change from a highly centralized generation side more to go decentralized or distributed generation. Is that good? Uh, that is good. I think we need to have all of these of above. I mean, it, what Jeff said is absolutely true. We can't just do the one without the, the other. We need base load. We need distributed generation. We need to minimize losses. And these sort of technologies are actually there to minimize losses, 
to make the system more reliable and it provide more, uh, you know, uh, cheaper electricity actually to our customers. So it's really a win-win. And uh, it, it's great to see the communications technology, the power, power electronics technology, and the generation technology come, come sort of co together at this stage of the development and make, uh, you know, energy a real interesting career and also a very valuable and uh, uh, you know, future uh, aspect of the economy in this region and, you know, of course, across the world. Yeah, well, you know, I was, I was going to say, one, just to put into perspective, though, one of the things you're seeing today is that really the two largest new generation technologies out there are gas, mm -hmm. utilizing natural gas for power production, and then probably wind. Those have been um, lately the two most And popular. natural gas, Jeff, because it's still cheap? Because the price of natural gas is very low, we have massive reserves of, yeah. of natural gas here, identified in part by shale gas. Oh, okay, yeah. so wait, but, but, let, me, let me follow this okay. thread. So if natural gas is cheap now, and if you, you know, some of your base load is right. done through natural gas, and people start piling on natural gas, aren't we going to have the same problem with the wholesale prices that they're going to go skyward, and we're going to be right back to the fossil fuel challenge? Well, that's a possibility. I think the, what happened in the 07 and 08 time frame was, was more of a more of a financial uh, issue that we ran into as far as the natural gas spiking. Uh, I think, as, as you pointed out, the new, the new fines in natural gas through the fracking, the new fracking system, that has really opened up a whole new arena. You know, five years ago or ten years ago, you used to call uh, nuclear you know, kind of the next fuel. Well, it's kind of questionable now. What is the next fuel? Is it nuclear? Is it natural gas? But I guess to the point of your question, uh, time will tell. I think as you bring on renewables and you bring on nuclear, nuclear is still in the game. As you bring that on, natural gas will be, as, as one of you folks said, it's going to be one of the components. It's not going to be just solar. It's not going to be just biomass. It's not going to be just coal. It's not going to be just nuclear or hydro or any of those. It's going to have to be a mix. So I think, I think as time goes on, the fuel availability, whatever that is during that time period, will tend to you know, tend to predict and tend to dis decide and guide what the generation mix will look like. Oh, okay, so Bill, th then let, let's go downstream from where the right. fuel comes into the system, whatever that is, and we've talked about the, you know, the sustainable nature of it and the alternate nature of it and solar and wind. At, at what point does a an energy cluster, and let's use Silicon Valley, you know, mm -hmm. in Silicon Valley, we know what that means in Silicon Valley. The, the great, great branding job, if nothing else. But at what point, where's the tipping point for the Carolinas to become taken seriously, and maybe it's not right. the right way to say it, but taken seriously to the rest of the world to say, you know, those guys really do have it together. They are in it for long term. Where's the tipping point for that? Well, I think uh, in the Carolinas, we're past it. We were talking before the show came on that the, the Carolinas nuclear cluster, which consists from a footprint standpoint of both North Carolina, South Carolina, and probably reaching a little bit into Georgia, uh, has, you know, with, I think, uh, four or five nuclear plants under construction here, plus the fact that the Department of Energy, I think, recognizes projects that uh, SCRA mm -hmm. has led and has been involved, uh, not only the South Carolina universities, primarily USC and Clemson, but also some of our partners in North Carolina, uh, as one of the top five states for testing uh, alternative energy applications, ranging from wind to fuel cells to um, you know, solar type technologies. Mm -hmm. So I think we've passed the tipping point, and I think once you get a, a, a critical mass that is of companies and, uh, you know, technology leaders that are driving the cost of these technologies uh, down and the utilization of the technologies up, uh, like we have the opportunity mm -hmm. to do with the uh, methane to hydrogen to fuel cells project that we're leading on behalf of BMW and uh, corporate partners, Amoresco and, and Waste Management, with help from the Department of Energy. Once you see that type of um, density start to occur, you've got a cluster and you're, you're past mm -hmm. the tipping point. And I think the point that, you know, we're going to be working on portfolios of energy applications over the next several decades until the economics of those alternatives shake out I, I think is very valid. We're, we're going to have a lot of interesting stuff going on. Mm -hmm. I, I, think it, I think it goes beyond just having one or two companies that, that are really yeah. the, the driving force. I mean, it used to be Duke Power was really what drove. You the had energy. to have them on board. You had to have them on board, and you, had, yeah. and you had Piedmont. But what you have today is you have, a, you have a collection of companies which have come to this region because they recognize it's the place to do energy business and where like-minded folks are, are located. So you right. have the full diversity of companies that are represented. You have the traditional energy providers. 
you have companies which provide the technologies, you have companies which build those technologies, the Shaws of the world. Then you have a lot of the suppliers and sub-suppliers, companies like Locks, which provide welding, mm -hmm. um, you know, SPX, which provides cooling towers and others. So we really have the full diversity of companies here in this region. Uh, latest numbers for, for, for the Charlotte region, I'm not as familiar with South Carolina, you know, 270 com companies, 27,000 employees. When you combine that with having the research base and the investment that State of North Carolina has made in Epic, it re really does give you that that so, red hub so, effect. Oh, so, Jeff, do you think do you think we've reached the tipping point? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. absolutely. A while ago, yeah. we we I think we probably reached that point uh, three or four years ago yeah. when you had um, companies like Shaw and Areva and Westinghouse. More recently, Babcock and Wilcox, mm -hmm. which has put its headquarters here. Um, Mitsubishi Nuclear has yeah. uh, has decided to put its headquarters here in Charlotte. We really got to that point. And when Siemens announced that they were going to put their major manufacturing facility here, 1800, uh, 15 to 1,800 workers, that was a real signal mm. that this was a place to be. Uh, uh, Johan, uh, you know, we talk, we've talked a little bit around policy, around government support, and around public policy. If it were not for public policy, the way it is structured right now, and th there is debate whether it's efficient or not, or if it's, if it's caught up with kind of the technology, but... Uh, it, if it were not for policy, would, would a lot of these alternative, these solar farms, these, uh, these biomass uh, initiatives, would they be able to be competitive? Well, I mean, without incentives <clears throat> per se, um, most of these will not be um, com cost competitive with other uh, resources. The, the issue is you have to do that. You know, we're talking about coal and nuclear being a 50 to 80 year sort of industry. So you have to really invest somewhat in those newer technologies to actually make them also com cost comp competitive. We saw in the last five years, due to some of these policies, that these technologies did in indeed decrease in price range dramatically. We've seen you know, solar drop in mm -hmm. price probably half in five years' time. Uh, so in order to actually grow the business, you need those policies. Uh, you have to eventually so start making a decision when to pull back those policies. But really to start those new uh, technologies, start those new uh, uh, aspects of a cleaner uh, generation uh, pool, we need to have that sort of investment going. Uh, uh, okay, yeah, Wayne, go I, ahead. I'm sorry, I do want to kind of go back to your question. I think it even goes, goes even before the question of would it be competitive. It would it be competitive. Actually, would it have happened? If you yeah. go back to August 2007, our state legislator, legislator saw the wisdom. They, they wanted to make this, this state self-sufficient and help make this country self-sufficient with regard to energy and they passed a law called the Re Renewable Energy Portfolio Standard. If that law had not passed, my guess is we would not be where we exactly. are today with solar. Mm -hmm. Do you, is that a, is that a, is that a, a, a is it, is that winded your back more than it's uh, a competitive <clears throat> issue well, for no, you? Well, what, what that law basically did to encourage the development of solar and renewable energy the law basically said we're going to require we're going to you know require utilities, uh, cooperatives, investor-owned municipals, all of us require us by 2018 to have 10 percent of our total sales come from a renewable resource. So that's a that's a big incentive. So what we did, what we did, and all utilities did, went out and began to search for solar farms. That's what that's why we built the solar farm we did. Well, why doesn't Canada. South Carolina have that? Well, it's politics, but let me take a slightly contrarian view. <laughs> There's a surprise. Well, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, there is no renewable standard in South Carolina. So in our world, what we've been searching for are those vertical market niches where, without a subsidy, the alternative and sustainable technology pays off. And so going back to the BMW project, right. a few years ago we, we tested hydrogen fuel cells in forklifts, and it turns out when you make the conversion from a battery powered fleet, particularly if you're working 24-7 indoors, to a fuel cell powered fleet, there's an additional 15 to 20 percent savings overall on the annual cost of, of uh, operating that fleet. And it's even cheaper if you can crack a methane source, source and have a renewal source of the hydrogen. You don't have to bottle it and truck it in. Mm -hmm. So when BMW saw those economics for that particular application, they've committed uh, between two phases, 10 to 18 million dollars to convert their whole you know, forklift and dredge fleet to that. So uh, uh, a gallon of gas in theater in Iraq and Afghanistan costs six, 400 to 600 dollars. So we've specialized on alternative energy applications for the military where the, the ROI on those type of things is very clear. It makes a lot more. Yeah. So I, I think, you know, we were talking before the show, but, uh, you know, 
alternative and renewables, until you get down to the, I think, I think it's a magic 10 cents a kilowatt hour, really aren't going to be mass market products. They're going to be niche kind mm -hmm. of products. But you can find today uh, specific applications where the ROI for alternative sources is very clear. And I think if we, fo we focus on those as corporations developing and deploying these technologies, over time, it'll it'll fill in around the, the traditional uh, to, to, to fill in the to fill in the puzzle though, and, and to, to layer on top of Wayne, and that was certainly the the change that North Carolina made that provided the incentives yeah. and system mm -hmm. system. But you also have to look at the federal level on production mm -hmm. tax credits. Um, you know, there is a it was a, is a major subsidy that goes into solar and wind. That sunsets unless it's renewed at the end of December of two thousand and twelve. So right now you see a lot of companies that are trying to get their wind and solar projects in place before that timeline because under the current circumstances, it's certainly plausible that those, that those tax incentives may go away. And as we've seen in the past, when they did, it had a major impact on the number of those units that were ordered. You know, Jeff, you spent some time at the NRC. You kind of know inside baseball around policy. What I'd like to think so. <laughs> well, it, probably much to your detriment in some cases. Um, why is there? Why has there not been more movement on a and a much broader energy policy for this country? It seems like it is it is so needed. Boy, that's 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 a good question. I mean, the, the problem is that that all too often people are looking at individual pieces. Mm -hmm. You know, a member of Congress says, "Well, I want to support wind and solar, but I don't want to support nuclear. I want to support nuclear. I don't really care about wind and solar. I want to support." the coal industry, which is in my state, or I want to support the gas industry, mm -hmm. which is in my state. And so we balkanized our policy making on that to a certain degree. And as a country, we really need to look beyond that. We need to have the leadership to say, we need energy diversity in this country if we're going to have energy security. Is so that, we need is everything. That, is that championed in the corporate side, or does there need to be a real champion within the policy, public, public policy? I, I, I think there needs to be champions on both. Right. Um, yeah, the, very, the problem is if you let the politicians, and I worked with many of them for a long period of time, if you let them go on their own, you know, they're advised by people who are quite young who really don't understand the industry. Um, at the same time, if it was simply corporate-driven, you'd have some issues with that one as well. I, I think one of the issues that industry has, the utilities have, is each one of them has a different portfolio. Those who are coal heavy obviously want to defend those interests. Those who are nuclear heavy right. want to defend those and, and, and so on. So it makes it very, very difficult. Is this another case where we need a Blue Ribbon Commission? Perhaps, but we really do need to come up with a, with a diverse energy portfolio that's going to, going to help our energy security. Uh, Wayne, okay, he, here's the thing. Do you, do you, uh, are, are you more encouraged going forward that we're going to have a, cl a clearer way forward the next decade? And especially given, let me back up and ask you this. Uh, we all know what happened in Japan, the Fukushima plant. Uh, and that clearly stopped some uh, forward momentum on, on building nuclear uh, facilities. Do you think it was the death knell for nuclear in the United States, or do you think it was a pause that may be refreshed? M from my perspective, I think it's a pause. I think it's a refresh. I don't think, I'm not, I don't have the inside ball to the <laughs> nuclear. That's from my perspective. I yeah. think it was, uh, obviously it was tragic what happened, but I think the way the NRC has taken the approach, we have learned from it in this country. So I think it's a pause is we all should not do a lot of things, whether it's energy policy or whatever. It's a pause. We looked at it. We looked at ourselves in the mirror and said, here's some things we can improve in this country. So I think, you know, the United States, I think, long term will will benefit from the learnings from that experience. And so, notwithstanding no, Siemens has pulled out of building nuclear plants, you think that that's a one-off on Siemens and that doesn't have anything to do with the Oh, I, absolutely. And, 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 and I, was, I was about ready to jump in when you, when you talked <laughs> about I, I, where it was going. I call on you, Yeah, you no, would, so. don't worry. That, that's <laughs> the case. Well, no, I mean, I, certainly we, people saw the example of Germany, Italy, the powerhouse of Venezuela. They, you know, they made the decision they weren't going to go forward with nuclear power plants. But when we looked at all the rest of the countries out there, while they have perhaps moved it out a little bit to the right on their schedule, um, they are continuing to move forward. I mean, I travel week after week outside of the United States talking to countries that very much want to move forward in building new nuclear power plants. For our part, we're building, you know, we're building six in China. Those have not stopped. Um, we are part of attempts to build two in South Carolina and two in Georgia. We expect the NRC to issue an approval for that late December, perhaps early January, 
and we'll move forward. We'll have, we'll have uh, by this time next year, we certainly hope to have a couple of thousand people in both those states working very hard to, to pour concrete and get those plants built. And Chris, to the benefit of the NRC and the whole utility and, uh, industry, I think it was prudent to take a pause. I think it was prudent to mm -hmm. see what can we learn from this. And, and I agree with uh, you 100% that I don't think, I think, it's, I don't think it's going to affect the long term of nuclear. Uh, Johan, Bill, I want to switch gears a little bit. How, how do we supply, I'll start with you, Johan, how do we supply, when we talk about solar, when we talk about biomass, when we talk about wind, and that seems to be a pretty, you know, a very popular issue these days, uh, how do we supply energy 24-7, 365, with that kind of technology? Bottom line, we can't. Right. Okay. I think so, we all want to jump in on this. So, <laughs> so, I, I agree. <laughs> so I think it's, it's intermittent source. Right. Yeah. So uh, as soon as we uh, understand that there's a there's a generation mix and there's a power balancing requirement for uh, renewables, especially wind and solar, we have to have those as part of a partial. So you have storage technology. It's absolutely part of that, that equation. You have to have fast ramping generation to balance out these power, power swings and power development. Uh, you can't afford to build overbuild transmission distribution networks just to add more solar and wind to it. So there's a there's a big um, you know drive to really look at it, a balanced portfolio, looking at storage, looking at how to make solar and wind more dispatchable. Yeah. You have to have That's a dispatchable good. resource eventually, and if you don't have your technologies like like uh, storage technology, you know interacting between fast ramping generation and uh, renewables. We can't make this work. So, okay. Bill, is, is the, are, the, are the storage technologies or the transmission technologies advancing quickly enough for these alternative ways of, of, of energy to, to catch up or to be more of a supply than, than more of a novelty? And that's probably not a fair assessment, but I think you know. Well, yes, they are. I mean, we, we've looked at and supported through the la SC launch program a number of companies that have these large-scale capacitors and fast ramping type of uh, intelligence. And in in they're essentially big fuel cells, uh, big capacitors in, in a variety of techniques. The, the challenge is uh, the, the, the availability and cost of capital to deploy uh, you know these these uh, types of large scale applications, and then uh, you know again I'll not to sound like a broken record, but go back to how can we drive the cost back to the magic ten per, ten cents per kilowatt hour so that it's a practical application, and there there uh, can blend in the that cost of power into the general grid and, that, and still have the utilities. Be is able that to make ten money. cents per kilowatt hour? Is that kind of the standard? That's not standard, but is that held out there as kind of the tipping point for it, this? It varies in what where you are in the United States. Like in California, it'll be higher than that, yeah. right? But um, um, I, I think if you look at the the cost of a typical uh, gas or uh, coal or even nuclear plant as the more efficient, you know, cost-effective plants are coming on stream, that's kind of a barrier. And so if you can get new applications that can meet or be below that type of cost or equivalent calculated cost, I think that's where you're going to see the point where, um, you know, it, uh, alternative renewable energy is a, is a kind of a general consumer type of product. Until that time, I, I'll go back and say that we're going to have to find those those vertical applications where the alternative energy doesn't have an intermittency type of problem. Mm -hmm. right. uh, it's adequate supply. It's it's more cost effective than the current available alternatives. And though you know we're trying to steer our corporate partners and our, and their suppliers into those market spaces. We have less than a minute left. What's the next big thing in the in, in the alternative energy in energy's evolution? What is it? Well, I think I think really to to be able to identify storage technologies yeah, is, right. is is really the key. So batteries. Well, it's going to be batteries. It's going to be it's fuel, fuel cells, fuel cells, fuel cells. all sorts of where you yeah. can store you can store energy. Yeah. You know, and and actually, are they just not stable? Is it not safe? Is the technology out there? But price, it hasn't. It's a price range. You know, price yeah. and lifetime. Um, so you have to have a good price uh, range, and you have to have a good lifetime. Will it be exponentially better than the storage we have now? Is that what we're talking about, or marginally better? It, you know, all of these things are going to be marginal. You yeah. won't see a dramatic leap forward. Yeah. leap forward. But what I would like to put a plug in is, is the smart grid. 
you know, technology not just in the generation side, but on the smart grid side really is, is, is where we that, can get the price down. Johan, that's the last word. I wish it didn't have to be, but it is for now. Thank you uh, for being Thank on the you. program. Always nice to see you, Jeff. Thanks great, for being here. Great to see you, Chris. Uh, Bill, congratulations on a great year down Thank there. Thank you. Uh, nice to meet you, Wayne. Thanks for being Thank here. Thank you for having us. Until next week, I'm Chris William. Good night. Major funding for Carolina Business Review was provided by the Duke Endowment, a private foundation in Charlotte, enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. And by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina, who's responsible for rising health care costs. Join Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. Grant Thornton, an international accounting, tax, and business advisory organization dedicated to serving middle market companies. Grant Thornton, a passion for the business of accounting. Novant Health is a not-for-profit group of hospitals and medical clinics caring for surrounding communities. Their nurses, physicians, and staff are nationally recognized for their remarkable devotion to patient care. And by Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Promotional consideration provided by Business North Carolina Magazine. For more information, visit carolinabusinessreview.com.